Now, we've been talking about money matters this month, and we're going to be talking about money matters, um, family, relationships, and marriage this week. Today, we would lay foundation for Saturday, I mean for Wednesday. On Wednesday, I want everybody to please come. We're going to use menti.com because I understand there are quite a number of us that uh, because we don't want to upset the people moderating, so we don't ask the questions bothering us. And at times, we don't want people to know, I mean, to get into our business. So we don't say the real things uh, going on in our lives. Now, the whole idea of fellowship, why the Bible says we should not neglect, neglect the fellowship of the brethren, is because we should come together and discuss real issues. Uh, it's just that the spirit of religion has taken over the church and we, we are much more pretenders in church uh, nowadays than the realities that we experience outside the church. But we want to change that here. So we want everybody to come because we all face challenges. We all have real life issues we face, either directly or at a time or the other. We all have questions. So we want you to come on, on Wednesday and we're gonna be talking about this money business. And we're talking about as it affects family, as it affects your courtship. Because if you're dating a guy that will not allow you know what he's earning while you are dating, it's a major red flag as far as I'm concerned. Um, because if he can't be truthful while he's courting you about what he's earning, because he feels, for whatever reason, you understand. It may just be a recipe for bigger problems by the time you're married. And some of these things we don't know. We think it's green light. You understand? We don't know it's really made. It's not amber. It's real red light. You know? So we would like to come together and discuss it. Family matters, relationship matters, and courtship matters. Maybe you've done business with a Christian that went terribly bad. And these days, you would rather do business with a Muslim than with a Christian. And that's some of the realities that we face in life. Um, we've had Christians come do stuff for us at church. Um, and unbelievers have given us better quotes than the Christians we invited to fix things at church. So these are the real challenges we face at church. And we want to come and discuss it, why these things are so and why it should not be so. We're going to have a panel. Because it's not just about relationships. We're going to be talking about self-development. Because it's the plan and the purpose of God that we flourish and we prosper. We're going to be talking about our careers. We're going to be talking about business, how to start businesses. People like me that would like to start a business. So we'd like to talk about things uh, that would spur the growth of the seed of greatness that has been lying latent in your life and in your spirit. I want you to please plan to come. Now, um, we're going to have a panel on Wednesday. One of the panelists will be a successful architect that's going to come and share with us his personal experience, challenges, and how God helped him. And of course, we would all answer questions together. The second person on that panel would be a career development specialist. So whatever it is that is your career goal, there are times these are sessions that people pay money for. Now, not just for one of them, to have a session with you, and you gladly pay your hundred dollars to go for those conferences because you know that those it will give you a, 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 a platform and access to getting better jobs that would um, make your life much better. But here at church, Jesus already paid the hundred dollars with his blood, so you are coming free of charge. So I need you to please come. And of course, we would have a management consultant to come and discuss with us practical things. And I'm talking years of experience, an experienced management consultant. So I want you to come. And of course, lots of anointed men and women of God. I mean all of us, anointed men and women of God. Together, we would come and discuss these issues, challenges, and prefer solutions to them. May God hasting our feet here on Wednesday in Jesus' name. Amen. So mine is just to lay the foundation for our discussion on Wednesday. And I'm going to start with, there are three things I'd like to talk about. I'll start with one. If I'm able to finish, I'll move to the next one. I'd like to talk about financial responsibility to self, 
financial responsibility in marriages to our spouses and financial responsibility to our children. And of course, there are actually seven sub-items there. Financial responsibility to our parents. Uh, because if you don't take care of your aged parents, uh, you may be just, just inadvertently making a major mistake. Setting a limit to your growth and your success. When those parents, those elders are happy, they don't need to express anything. Even if your prayer parent was wicked to you, I remember one prayer conference when the Spirit of God made the minister announce that everybody should send money. I don't know if you remember. Send a certain amount of money to all our parents. Let them receive the money. Whether they hate you or not, just obey God. The blessings would flow thereafter. But we're not going to talk about that. And of course, financial responsibility to church and the community. But today, so let's start with financial responsibility to self. In Proverbs chapter 22, verse 2, Proverbs 22, verse 2, the Bible says, the rich and the poor, the Lord God made them both. Can we say that again? Just repeat after me. The rich and the poor, the Lord God made them both. The question I ask myself is this. God, why did you make one rich and the other poor? It also means, ladies and gentlemen, that the God of the rich is also the God of the poor. The God of the poor is also the God of the rich. Our choices in life makes all the difference. Embedded in everyone is a divine purpose because God said, before your parent, you were conceived in your mother's womb. He said, I knew you. Before you were conceived, a purpose was set for each of us. You are not an accidental creature. It doesn't matter whether your parents were not prepared for you to come. There is a God in heaven that knew, needed someone exactly like you to fulfill divine purpose. So there are no accidents with God. The seed of greatness is embedded in every one of us. The question is, what have you done with your seed of greatness? It's like the story of the talent. God gave everyone talent. Some went and used it and multiplied it. And one of the three went and buried it. Have you buried your seed? My burden this morning is that every buried seed of greatness, every submerged seed of greatness, they would find a platform for expression in the name of Jesus Christ. Before this year comes to an end, heaven will open our eyes and unplug, unplug our ears and he will cause that which he has destined for us to begin to find expression to begin to find favor, to begin to speak into those things, into manifestation in the name of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that has clouded the glory of God, whatever it is that has brought confusion into our lives, order will come, direction will come in the name of Jesus Christ. I have a problem with people that have been on the same spot for too long going around in circles, active, but not making progress. It's not the plan and the purpose of God. I have a problem with first generation parents and people that come to the United States. And you've been on the same job, on the same position, the same status, the same security guard you've been doing for 30 years, you are still standing by that same gate doing security guard. I have a serious problem with that. I don't have a problem with starting small. Because everyone, even the Bible speaks of the mustard seed that becomes a great oak tree. We, for first generation immigrants, there's something that cuts across all of us. That's the fact that America levels everybody. 
I remember very well, I thought I was a successful attorney, at least by my own definition. I don't know about anybody else's. I had a law firm. We had a partner in London. We were planning to start one in several cities. The vision is, was this. I won't share it so that somebody will not steal it. <laughs> but the vision was that we were going to set up a law firm because we found out that a lot of Africans do business intercontinentally. So that means somebody could travel from Africa, anywhere in Africa, start a business or buy something in China and they are doing business in Africa. So the target and the purpose was for every business, they need legal documentation. And for every transaction, you need a contract. So the plan was that we will have a law firm that will service you everywhere you are in several continents, the same law firm. Because it's easier to deal with the same law firm that knows your history. It's like dealing with a medical doctor that knows your history. It's even much more comforting to a business person when you go to Europe, the same law firm that did your business in America is the same one doing your business. You just call the branch of the law firm. That was the goal. That was the vision. So when my wife got her job posted out here, I handed over the law firm to one of the partners and said, I would come and start a branch here. So you can imagine the mindset of someone that was super active, that had all these dreams coming to America. <laughs> no, mine is not Akim, the movie. But mine was the reverse. My darling wife, of course, the first day we went to BTC, her name was already on the dock, we celebrated. So she went to work and I was at home. So after, you know, you watch TV, you take a break for the first few days. You sleep, you watch TV, you eat. You will be excitedly say bye-bye to her when she's leaving. So after I've watched all the TVs, I knew all the programs, you know. The ones I shouldn't watch, the one I should watch, I had no job. So I, was, I watched them. Why are you looking at me as if you two didn't watch those things? Thank you. You know, you know the Jerry Spring, is it? Oh, so you know the Jerry. Oh, I completed it. I set you up and you fell for it. <laughs> So my wife would call me and say, sweetheart, you know, she would say all the niceties and all, and what would follow is, please, on my way home, could you help me bring out the stew from the, you know, so that it will thaw before I get home, you know? And you that you don't have a job, you, you can't say no, you won't, you know, you won't bring out the stew from, you know, the soup from the refrigerator. You bring out stew today, you help bring the children from kids are kids the next day. And the roles were suddenly reversed. <laughs> America just levels you. The worst part of my own story was that back in Africa, I could drive 100 miles with one finger. You know, except for the potholes and, uh, you know, and all the things that come with it. I went for my driving test. <laughs> and one young lady like that, I don't want to call her silly, but, you know, the young lady just, I, I just did the thing. I, I mean, I'd been driving. I'm sure before she was born, I was already a super driver. So I just did the driving, you know. Boom. Finished. What else? You know, give me my certificate. She said you failed. <laughs> uh, 
I looked at her. You know, in Africa, how you look at somebody from head to toe, but she was sitting next to me. I looked at her. I said, oh, God. How will I go home and tell my wife I failed driving test? <laughs> I said, what did I do wrong? She said, you didn't come to a complete halt at the stop sign. That's a felony. I said, well, to long, cut the long story short, I had to do the test again. But I have a problem, church. My problem is this. That was a start for me. But I did not remain there. I looked for a law firm and started serving lawyers that were, could have been serving under me. I started carrying folders and doing research for them. They would even be giving me instructions and be correcting the briefs that I write. And I said, it's not your fault. <laughs> <laughs> My father had told me, you know, that a man does not follow a woman. That it's the other way, that I followed a woman to America. That's why you, 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 you are treating me like this. It was a traumatic season for me. But church, I did not remain like that. I have a problem with starting at that level and remaining at that level. There's nothing wrong with starting small. In fact, it's the order in the realms of the spirit. There's nothing wrong with starting small. There's nothing wrong with serving my wife. There's nothing wrong in bringing out all, if she does that, if she tells me, now I do it with joy because I'm already fulfilled seven by myself. I have a problem with remaining a security guard at the same gate for 30 years and not making progress. After 30 years, you should own the gate and the property behind the gate. That's the plan of God. And so when we're talking about matters like this, we would like to challenge you. You must remain, you must suddenly get uncomfortable with your comfort zone where you have been seated for too long. It doesn't matter how many people are in your pity party comparing misery notes with each other. You need to come out of that circle and step up into the place of your next level in the name of Jesus Christ. The rich and the poor, the Lord God made them both. He made them with the seed of greatness. Some have done something with their seed. Others have buried their seed. May your seed be uncovered this week in the name of Jesus Christ. But the unfortunate thing, church, is that some of us, we are poor because of the circumstances of our birth. The Bible tells us in 2 Kings chapter 4 of a widow, the widow of Zarephath. Her husband was active in church. He was a minister. He was a pastor. But he got so neck deep in the credit, in, with credit cards. And that's another problem. Some of us, we've become poor because we spend more than we earn. There's no stop, no reason, no calculation, no budget, no break, no jam, no nothing. You just keep buying. You must have it. The next credit card that comes, you collect it. And you keep pretending to the Joneses that are not even noticing what you are wearing. If you are living in a house you cannot afford, go sell the house and go start from bottom up. If you are living in an apartment you cannot afford, leave the two room, go get a one room. If you are riding a car you cannot afford, in an apart, you are riding a BMW 7 Series in a one-room apartment. Go sell that car 
and downgrade and be reasonable because your future is greater than the people you are trying to impress. The same people you think you are impressing would be the ones that would gather together to laugh at you later. This man was, a, he was committedly serving in church, but he died poor. So poor that the credit card company came for his children. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, it said, true godliness comes with contentment and it produces great wealth. The unfortunate thing, church, is that some of us were poor because of our attitude. You have the seed of greatness inside of you, but for every seed of greatness, you need people around you for every purpose, for every vision, you need people to actualize it. I found out that when a man finds purpose, God sends people. When a man discovers his purpose, that seed of greatness, that direction, God rallies people. Every time you go on WhatsApp or Facebook, you are fulfilling Zuckerberg's purpose and destiny. It's the order of life. Some of us, we've driven away the people the, that God sent to us as investment to our purpose. Because in everybody, there is an investment in their life that God located them around you for to make your dream come to pass. I've shared with us before, and I'll repeat it again. Someone prayed a prayer, and he said to me, he said, may you never turn, may you never see, may you never make your friend your enemy, and may you never make your enemy your friend. Because some of us, the people God sent to us as our friends, we've made them our enemies. I googled the definition of attitude and it says, it reads, attitude is defined as a settled way of thinking that is reflected in a person's behavior. A settled way, settled, settled way of thinking that is reflected in your behavior in the way you relate to people. It's a thought process but it oozes out of your system. And you come to church praying against enemy, forgetting that you are the very enemy of yourself. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 30, verse 30 to 31, the Bible speaks of 12 spies that were sent to spy the promised land. Two of them, Caleb. In verse 30, the Bible said, and Caleb shut down the people. And he said, let us go up at once and possess the land for we are able to overcome it. In verse 31, the Bible spoke of what the others recorded what the other ten spies said. They said, we are not able to go up against these people for they are stronger than us. Caleb said, we can do it. In fact, Caleb relegated the opposition to an inanimate object. He said we can overcome it. Referring to the Jebusites and all the people that were placeholders in their promised land. Never see the placeholders of your destiny as replacers. They are not meant to replace you. They are just placeholders for the time you mature enough to access your blessing. It's the program and the plan of God. But some of us, we've seen them as replacers. Some of us, we even fear them. Some of us, we, we, we revere them. Some of us, we begin to respect them and bow to them. And they are just placeholders. Help me tell someone I'm coming. 
Because I had not seen here, had not heard what God has put together for you and I. They haven't seen anything yet. Tell another person they have not seen anything yet. I am still coming. Because what we are celebrating today is nothing compared to what heaven wants us to celebrate at the end of this year. We will overcome every challenge. We will overcome the Jebusites. We will overcome the Hittites. No matter their stature, no matter their position and their possession, no matter how instrumental, intelligent and smart they are, they are just what? Place holders. For the time we are ready. But our attitude must show that we are on a journey. We are a people on a journey. That this is not the last bus stop. It's not the final period in my story. For people that have written you off, they have already written the conclusion of the story. Tell them to hold on. It's not yet conclusion time. Because God is not through with us yet. We may not look like it, but when we get to our promised land, we will look it. Amen. By the special grace of God in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your attitude will determine your altitude and how far you go in life. The attitude of failure guarantees failure. If you project failure, you speak failure. Oh, I can't do this. Oh, I failed too many times. Bible says the righteous fall at seven times and he gets back up. Champions are not made from people that stay down. Enthusiasm in life is contagious. It makes people flock around you. You can profit from the investment opportunity in the people God planted around you. You are meant to profit with it. With it. Joshua and Caleb had a different attitude and they made it to the promised land. Let me round up with Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible tells us the story of Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible said, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. <laughs> Please, I need you to underline them there. Because in the same verse of the scripture, the Bible said, and God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It means embedded in Adam was his Eve. So when Eve was tending the garden, I mean, when Adam was tending the garden, Eve was where? Inside of him. It will make sense later. He says, Genesis chapter 1, and God blessed them. In verse 29, and God said, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth. That's why eating salad is good for the body. No, it's scriptural. Now, this I'm serious now. I'm not kidding. Because he says, I have given you this for food. And he said, even the animals, I have given them their own herbs that produces seed after its kind as what? As their food. Then God saw everything he made and it was good. Now fast forward it to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. My version of the Bible says, And the Lord God took the man and placed him in the garden of Eden to walk it and to watch over it. Three things God did. The Bible said, And God made man in his image. And God made man in his image. What's the image of God? You and I can't see it. At best, we see the glory. Because the Bible says God dwells in the midst of light that is unapproachable. 
The Bible said he's covered with glory. From head to toe, his, his clothing is glory. So we don't know whether he's male or female. We don't know whether he's naked or not. Because the glory covering was the same glory covering with which he clothed man at the beginning. Or he clothed man at the beginning. He made man in his image. The glory of his image was the glory of man. That was why at the beginning they did not know they were naked until sin crept in and the glory Ichabod the glory departed. Ichabod took place. That was when they knew they were naked and they tried to put leaves to cover their nakedness. And God said, how did you know you were naked? Because for as long as the glory was there, they had a covering. The same covering that God had that made them commune with God at the cool of the day, conversing with the creator of the heavens and the earth. They had, they looked alike. Remember when Moses went up onto the mount, the Bible said the glory of God rubbed off on him. They had to cover his face. Do you remember? So you can imagine when Adam was in the garden, talking with God every day. It was not just a momentary encounter. He had the same glory covering that God had. He had the same clothing that God had. So when God created man, he clothed him with glory. Number two, God gave him food. Number three, God placed him in the garden to walk and to tend it. He gave him walk. If you are going to marry, whenever you are ready to marry, and if you are married, it is also applicable, the three dimensions that were there at the beginning. The man you would marry must be covered with the glory of God. And you cannot access the glory of God without the knowledge of God. Salvation is not an option. It's not a function of coming to church. He must know his God. So that the purpose and the plan of God must be what he is pursuing and not mere mammon, which is money. Money does not equate to success. If you see him rich without God, he can be a rich moron. It's, it's an error to equate success with money or money with wealth. So it's important for us this age that the man you would marry, ladies, must be covered with the glory of God. And for you to relate with him, you must also be covered with the glory of God. Number two, church. God gave him food. He must be able to provide. For the Bible says a man that, should, that will not walk should not eat. It doesn't matter how many are the job, whether he's standing like that gate person at Walmart opening the door. Because that is his now. He has the seed of greatness inside of him. Discussing with him, you will know that this man is a man that is on a journey. A man that is on a journey is the one that needs a help meet. The one that does not have a journey, does not know where he's going, where he's coming from, does not need a help meet. When he knows where he's going, then he's ready to marry a wife. So there will not be confusion in the home. Because when you are embarking on your own journey, let him not be oppressing and be suppressing you. Because he doesn't have a journey to run. He's not going anywhere. And it becomes a nuisance and you have to be hiding to do your ministry. 
You have to be hiding to serve God. You have to be hiding to do stuff. And all the things you want to do, you can't do them. And that's one thing I'd like to say, church. That the responsibility of a woman goes beyond just being at home. As God gave you a purpose, God also gave the woman a purpose. Embedded inside Adam was his Eve. When he was tending the garden, Eve was tending the garden through him. She has a garden to tend and she has a divine placement for herself in God. It's not enough to give birth to children. Your responsibility goes beyond just giving birth to children. You have a purpose to fulfill. The responsibility of the man is to be a support for you to fulfill your purpose and your destiny. Together, fulfilling greatness in God. That's the plan of God. That's the plan and the purpose of God. And number three, church. The Bible said in that Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 that God placed him in the garden. There is a divine placement in God. May you not miss your position and your placement in the name of Jesus Christ. May you be with God at the right place at the right time in the name of Jesus. The pain some of us we are going through is because we've missed our placement. The pain we are going through is because we refuse to obey God when he positioned us. We've been made to believe that coming to Christ is just for gain, not for God. So our Christianity is godliness without contentment. Because in the program of God, it is that our godliness will come with contentment and it will lead to great success. And contentment there speaks of being happy at your position outside of external possession. There is a divine placement in God. And God placed him there to walk and to tend the garden. A man that does not walk is not fit to eat. I don't care where you started from. Maybe you had billions. I just told you my story. I heard the story of another man that celebrated his sixth year. It was a big grant because over years, God had promoted him. But he said, church, he gave his testimony that he started as a guard at night. Less than $10 an hour. But that was about 20, 30 years ago. He didn't remain there. That's why it's an error to remain on the same spot for several years. Church, because of my time, I would conclude with this. It's a story of a young girl that the father told. Please don't marry from this certain family because I see a trend of the spirit of poverty. You know, the Bible says, in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 15, the Bible says that the poverty of the poor is their ruin. It's like tautology. It's like going round in circles. The poverty of the poor is their ruin. That's the B part. And the father said, because I see a generational problem, daughter, please don't marry from that family. Now the daughter being a believer said, yes, dad, I will must marry him. But unfortunately, the guy looked it, but he had not broken the yoke of the cycle of poverty. He was an unbelieving believer. You know, just comes to church, doesn't have any spiritual foundation, no nothing. Whenever he feels like. 
But years later, after she had had a wish, she ran into problems. Because what the father saw was exactly what pay, played out. It is said in Africa that what an elder can see sitting down, a young person may not see it standing up. Shall we stand? We're going to pray, church. Because the Bible said the poverty of the poor is their ruin, Poverty there speaks beyond just the poverty of money. Uh, it goes beyond just talking about money. Poverty of the mind. A mind that cannot think. A mind that does not have the ability and capability for great things and greatness. Poverty of the soul. Poverty of attitude. Poverty in every dimension of life. Poverty can represent sickness. The ruin of the poor is his poverty. And the cycle of poverty can be broken. The yoke of poverty in any realm can be broken. Time would fail me to tell you examples of families that generationally they've broken the cycle and they hand over righteousness to their generations. We're going to pray this morning that the yoke of poverty, the yoke of it is not good enough, the yoke of I am not good enough, there are marriages generations of cycles of divorces in some families. Three generations, you've seen broken homes. And it seemed as if the cycle had continued over time. There are generations of families that their firstborn must give birth outside of wedlock. There, um, I, I, those negative cycles must be broken in the name of Jesus Christ. As we break the yoke, we hand over to our next generation, to the seventh generation. The baton of righteousness, the baton of strength and grace, wisdom and ability, greatness to become all that God has destined our children and us to become in the name of Jesus Christ. I want you to hold the hand of two people. We're going to pray for ourselves. I want you to plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Every yoke of poverty, every representation of poverty, poverty of the mind, poverty of the soul, poverty representing failure, whatever poverty represents in our lives, we ask this day, under this atmosphere, let the yoke be broken. Let the burden be lifted. We are coming out victorious in the name of Jesus. We enforce the authority of the name of Jesus. We enforce the deliverance in the blood of Jesus Christ. We ask this day. The Bible said he was stricken. He was, he was beaten for our deliverance, for our healing, for our lifting. We associate with him. We connect with his death and we rise up with his resurrection. This day supernaturally, in the name of Jesus, we are getting up out of fruitlessness, out of barrenness, out of deafness, out of blindness, out of everything that had limited any member of our families. In the name of Jesus Christ, let God arise. Let God arise. Let God arise. In the name of Jesus. We must succeed. We must break through every barrier. The next level here we come.
Jesus' name we have prayed. Let's drop our hands. Still with all eyes closed, I want you to cry out your heart and your burden to God. Like I said this morning, for those that joined the 5.30 a.m. prayers, it was so direct. I want us to connect with God with groanings that cannot be uttered with words. I want you to go to God and groan your way out of every limiting factor. Not just you, but every member of your family and your children, your siblings, your parents. At school, you must be the best. At work, in your career, God must push you forward. Let every contrary win. Let the momentum of life, let it go behind us in the name of Jesus Christ. We must find favor before God and before man. There must be a way. God must make a way for us. He must make a way for us. He must make a way for us. This week and this year, in the name of Jesus Christ, as the Lord liveth, we will testify of his faithfulness in the name of Jesus.